Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. I invite you to join me on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as a participant in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. If you have not heard of Brian Williams, you are in for a treat. I actually am impressed that he made the time today to be on this podcast. Dr. Williams is an important voice and an expert in the classical education tradition. I'm thrilled to welcome him to the show today because I think he is one of the most profound influencers of recovering the classical tradition. We all need to listen carefully to him because he knows the tradition. I'm thrilled to introduce you today to Dr. Williams. Welcome to the show. Uh, Well, thank you very much, and thanks for that uh, esteemed introduction. Uh, My mom will be very happy to hear that, Uh, but very (laughs) delighted to be here with you and have a conversation about classical education. Yeah, so I would like you to uh, go ahead and brag, tell tell our listeners (laughs) why you're an expert in classical education. Give us the lowdown of your expertise and who you are and what you do. Sure. So uh, my day job, I'm dean of the Templeton Honors College and the College of Arts and Humanities at Eastern University uh, in r- right outside of beautiful Philadelphia here in Pennsylvania. I am also the general editor of Principia, a journal of classical education, a brand new and the first uh, peer-reviewed academic journal of classical education. Uh, before this, I taught Christian ethics at the University of Oxford, where I did my doctorate and my doctoral thesis was on uh, the classical tradition on uh, Hugh of St. Victor, Philip Melanchthon and John Henry Newman, and the precursors, the connections between them, and how they uh, are distinguished from the kind of modern uh, approach to education. Uh, before that, I had done a couple uh, degrees, graduate degrees in historical theology, and taught for seven years at Care Paravel Latin School uh, in Topeka, Kansas, which is one of the first really arguably the first of our contemporary uh, classical schools, which was founded in 1980 by several graduates of a well-known program from the University of Kansas called the Pearson Integrated Humanities Program, which was founded and ran by three wonderful professors, Mm -hmm. Senior Nelikin and Quinn. And so I cut my teeth on classical education uh, officially at Care Paravel under the influence of really the IHP program and was uh, friends with a guy named uh, James Taylor, who wrote a book called uh, Poetic Knowledge. Poetic Knowledge, and yeah. So that's that's kind of my entry into it, though my, my, my classical uh, instincts, I think, were formed well before that, you know, and I've always been a lover of great books and mythology and a lot of the things that got a lot of us into this kind of world. So there you go. There's a there's a brief overview uh, of my entry in and a little bit of my story uh, to this point. I love this. OK, so this is very exciting because my, my listeners, my Facebook followers all know that one of my number one goals is to get everybody to understand what is classical education? What is the tradition? Capital T. Let's look back to the uh, founding fathers of the classical tradition to start us off on answering the question, what is classical education. And so I was recently reading your wonderful um, editor's introduction in the Principia. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say this because I don't know Latin. Principia. 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 Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) And that's Latin, right? Because I don't know Latin. Okay. And what does it mean? Uh, Kind of first principles, kind of first things, like the principal thing, the the original idea, uh, kind of founding idea. Perfect. So that actually totally matches perfectly. (laughs) And I'm embarrassed. I don't know Latin, but people who know me well know that I don't. Um, I did not get this classical education, but I I love classical education and and gave it to my children as best as I could. Um, Okay. So in this uh, two number one intro editor's introduction, you unpack beautifully through three frescoes, uh, opening us up this beautiful picture of what classical education is according to the tradition. So what I'd like to do to start off our conversation is, and we'll put all these pictures in the show notes so our listeners can 
go to links and pull them up and look at them while they're listening or look at them later if they're listening while they're driving. Um, I want you to unpack for us what these three frescoes mean to the tradition of classical education, if you could introduce our listeners to them. Sure. Let me preface that by saying that when I got into classical education, I went looking for the blueprint of classical education. I went looking for the teacher's guide, which I thought must have been written, you know, in fourth century BC Athens or first century Rome that just said, here's what you teach. Here's the books you read. And here's a pedagogical guide because we were calling ourselves classical. And I, I wanted to know what are we, are we really classical? What does that mean? And for, you know, after turning into the tradition and looking for that blueprint, I realized it doesn't really exist. And what you have is not a classical blueprint, but what we call the classical tradition. And so that's why I use these three frescoes to kind of help people understand what do we mean by a tradition? So these are three frescoes painted by Raphael in the Vatican, the most famous of which is the School of Athens, which, of course, many people know this, and many schools have these uh, reproduced in their, uh, the, on their walls. It's got uh, Plato and Aristotle in the middle of it, and they're surrounded by different figures from different eras uh, from the Greek philosophical tradition in little conversations about uh, philosophy and the liberal arts. So that's one. In the same room, though, you have a a painting called the Disputa or the Disputation of the Holy Sacrament. And here, rather than uh, Plato and Aristotle in the middle, you have a consecrated host or wafer or Eucharist or communion in the middle on an altar. And you have theologians from across the centuries, uh, from Jerome and St. Augustine and Aquinas and uh, poets like Dante uh, they're all discussing this single topic of the nature of the incarnation. Then in the same room, you also have on another wall uh, a painting called uh, Par just Parnassus. And there in the middle, instead of Plato and Aristotle or instead of the consecrated host, you have Apollo. And around Apollo, you have all these poets, again, from all different eras. Dante shows up again. I'm very pleased that Dante, uh, a bit of a Dante scholar, Dante shows up in two of the paintings, the only person. But you also have Sappho, and you have Virgil, and Homer, and other poets. And you've got all of these poets, philosophers, theologians from different eras, all in conversation. All uh, kind of hearkening back to some of the same fundamental questions you know, what is beauty? What is theology? Who is God? What is the incarnation? But then with Plato and Aristotle, you know, uh, wh where does philosophy lead us? Uh, how should we think? Uh, it's interesting that the, the, the School of Athens, when the very center of the painting is actually not either Plato or Aristotle, but the space between them where the conversation actually happens. And so I love this as an image of all three of these as an image of the classical tradition, which says, oh, it's this ongoing, developing conversation between people who care about the same things, who recognize this important set of questions. What is truth? What is goodness? What is beauty? What is holiness? You'll see the true, the good, the beautiful, and the holy in those three paintings. If you think of the philosophers debating the true and the good, the theologians debating the holy, and the poets debating the beautiful, and anytime somebody else comes on the scene, like a Dante, even though, you know, nobody was reading Dante, obviously, before Dante wrote, but once Dante comes on the scene, they realize, oh, this is a serious poet delving into these important human matters in rich and beautiful ways. We have to add him to, if you will, the tradition, add him to the conversation. You know, again, nobody was reading Shakespeare before Shakespeare wrote, but even though the tradition, you might say, was kind of 2,000 years in of, you know, what we think of as classical liberal arts, Shakespeare comes on the scene, and of course we have to add him to the conversation. So I, I love these three images uh, as, a, as depictions of the classical tradition as this ongoing conversation between people from different eras about the same kinds of things, as opposed to seeing as opposed to considering the classical um, 
uh, as opposed to the idea of a classical kind of blueprint or, you know, guide that was written authoritatively once for all, you know, 2000 years ago, which just doesn't exist. So final thought here, it just means that, you know, us, those of us involved in the classical education right now, we're just the latest moment in a long, ongoing, developing tradition asking some of the same questions, reading some of these same people who help us ask those questions and begin to answer them, but recognizing that sometimes our moment will throw up a new question that really hadn't been grappled with specifically in the past, but that they offer us the kind of resources to maybe think through um, our new moment. And that, um, you know, if we don't carry on the conversation, if we don't facilitate the conversation between these people, the, the tradition doesn't, won't go past us. It really depends on us to carry on this kind of ongoing conversation that we're just, you know, the latest moment in. Anyway, so there you go. That, that's my thoughts on those three, those three frescoes and why they, for me, depict the classical tradition. Right. So what I'm, what I'm hearing in, in, in this analysis of these paintings, which is so beautiful, thank you for going through that with, with us, um, is that a spirit of inquiry is really, really central to the tradition. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think it's rooted in questions. I mean, I, I'll say like the, the undergraduate program that I run here in the Temple and Honors College, we describe it as a great questions program. Mm -hmm. And the great questions endure throughout all of these eras. And then we turn to what we sometimes call the great authors or the great books to help us articulate those questions and begin to answer them. But it is rooted in the great questions, right? I mean, all of these poets are, ah, what is beauty? How do we depict human suffering? What is the human condition? These, these kind of ongoing questions that uh, animate us still today and mean that what we're not doing in the classical tradition is just receiving a block of you know, settled opinions and data and information from people before us, and then handing that block on to our students, who then hand it on to the next generation. Uh, that's not what's happening here. It is this ongoing conversation about what it means to be human and what it means to live well, and how we pursue both individually and socially, uh, you know, the true, good, beautiful, and holy uh, in the ways in the ways that we can. So, yes, I would say absolutely the spirit of inquiry and ongoing conversation through questions. Yeah. So, okay. So let's talk to some parents who are, who are looking at classical education as an option for their students. And they, they're like, there's this school and that school and uh, several to choose from in their community, which in some towns there are, right? Not in all towns, but in some towns, there's some different sure. models. To, we've got different models to choose from. We've got our Christian model. We've got maybe our charter school model down the yep. corner, maybe one or two of those. So, so Talk to us because I really want our listeners to understand the difference between, say, the tradition and maybe what we could see in some typical cl classical schools down the road from us. What would you say would be some points for them to look at to understand? I, I, mean, I guess and I, oh, let me back up a little bit here, too. So I'm thinking of the parent going, well, how could just a spirit of inquiry really help my student to learn? Like, right. I want my students to know the important things. Like if they're just asking questions and talking about these questions about what does it mean to be a human being, how is that going to really educate my child? So sure. let's let's kind of unpack all of that. That's a few questions in one there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's, it, it's fine. This is a conversation as well, which is lovely. <laughs> and conversations, uh, they go round and round and they move forward <laughs> sometimes incrementally. So that's totally fine. Um, I would say um, this what we're doing in classical ed and and i think what we what we see in the tradition is the it it really begins with the formation of a human person okay so we're not as i tell teachers often your job is not to get your students simply from grade three to grade four your job is not to get them from seven to eight your job is not to get them to high school graduation day and college entrance to the college or university of their choice or usually their parents choice we are educating 45 year olds and 65 year olds and 85 year olds meaning that students as teachers we're not responsible if you will to the 18 year old version of my student self but to their 28 48 and 68 year old version so we're trying to set people up for a lifetime of formation in all the various areas that are constitutive of human flourishing. So if you think 
intellectual formation, moral, aesthetic, spiritual, physical, practical, social. The question is, what do I need to do now in my school that begins their formation in these various areas that will carry forward no matter where they go to college, no matter what they do in their life and who they marry and where they live? So we want people who are being educated not simply for gainful employment, right? Not just to get a job, not just practical skills. Practical skills in a job are absolutely important, and they also were always part of the tradition. The, the mechanical or common arts were always there. But we're trying to form people who approach th their own selves, their neighbors, uh, the physical world, the spiritual world, if you will, with a posture of wonder, uh, a posture of uh, trying to nurture their intellectual appetite so that they go on wanting to learn and being able to ask, oh, what is that thing? Do I know that thing? Do I understand that thing? What do I think about that thing? And that could be you know, the stock market. It could be the flora and fauna in their backyard. It could be you know, uh, another uh, a world religion. It could be a different culture. You're, we're trying to foster people who uh, have a kind of, yeah, robust intellectual appetite and wonder uh, about the world around them, about their own souls and the people with whom they live. And so, so a spirit of inquiry will drive a human person throughout their life. And, and make them a kind of fully alive person engaged in and who has some, you know, I'll, I'll say it like this. Here's an example. So uh, a friend of mine, Chris Hall, who wrote a wonderful book called Recovering the Common Arts. So yes, he's been Chris, on our program. Yes, okay, yes, Chris, good. So Chris uh, was teaching a, a few days in a, uh, a class I was teaching this summer called Pedagogy 2 in our master's program in, in classical education. Chris and I are walking across our campus here, which has a, a protected wetland through the middle of it and lots of deer. And I was hearing birds tweeting. And I said, Chris, I hear birds tweeting. And I know Chris. And I said, what do you hear? Chris named the five different birds that were tweeting and then said three of them won't be here in a month because the insects that they eat will have either died off or moved on. Yes. Okay, Chris has an understanding of the natural world that I just don't. And so the world... That part of the world is more foreign to me, but it's more familiar to Chris. And so if you, anybody that's traveled in, internationally, if you go to a new culture, I was in uh, Morocco and Tunisia last year exploring some classical sites, and they were new cultures to me. I didn't know the language, but you know, after, you, after you're there for a little while, you kind of understand how things work. But when you first go, it's foreign, not familiar, and you feel uncomfortable. Okay, well, education in a way is about making the world feel less foreign and more familiar. And so that spirit of inquiry and that spirit of discovery is about discovering the world in which we live, whether that's the social world, the economic world, the political world, the natural world, and making the world feel less foreign. And so we want, you know, I mean, and, and learning is a, is a lifelong process. I mean, as any of us who teach, you know, no, the hardest thing uh, in creating a syllabus is deciding what books to leave out. And you have right. to tell my, oh, that's to for tell sure. My yes. I have to tell my students over and over and over again. I wanted to put Kierkegaard in this and I couldn't, but you you need to read them. And I wanted to put Dostoevsky in this syllabus, but I, I couldn't, but you need to read them, right? And just helping them understand that this is a lifelong journey. None of us can read everything, uh, but this this lifelong journey of wonder and discovery and, and just kind of sheer delight in uh, coming to understand the world in which we live, that's what we're trying to foster in our students. And that's the kind of right. people I think we want to we wanna form in, a, in our school. So I would say to parents, look for that kind of a school. I mean, a school, sometimes uh, Chris Perrin and I will make the, he's the, the president of Classical Academic Press, will distinguish between um, rigor and vigor. Uh, rigor being, you know, stiffness, uh, it's there in rigor mortis, which is what happens when something dies, versus vigorous, which is something that happens when it's living, you know, the living plant, the nurtured, thriving oak tree. And so I would say look for that kind of a school that's going to pursue vigor and has a long view of your student's formation and not simply rigor about getting them to memorize a bunch of stuff, stuff to pass a test, to, you know, graduate you know, to get into a college that you want them to get into. Anyway, 
So that, that long winded went long winded reflections there, but that's um, what I think we see in the tradition, and I think that's what we want to be a part of. Yes, thank you. That was so inspiring. I I'm already you know my, my listeners know how much I love Charlotte Mason. I'm hearing okay, Charlotte Mason in when you say education is about becoming more familiar. Yeah. Right. Mm. That's that's the science of relations. She talks about that the students need to come and have this relationship with the world around them, with everything in life. And Chris, your example of him understanding and knowing the birds, that's an exact example of what a Charlotte Mason education oh. ought to give to a student, immersing them in nature and going out and becoming a familiar yes. with the, the world around them. Doing nature study is so critical for especially young children to get them to learn how to have these connections with the world around them and interested in, in the world around them. I told Chris recently, I emailed him, I said, Chris, do you have like a quarter of an acre that I could come park an Airstream on for six months and just be a fly <laughs> on the wall on your property and watch how you live? Yeah. Because his life is so interesting and and what he does with bees and his property and he, he shares really fun stories on his Facebook page, but yeah. And I would say that, um, you know, at least here in the, the Templeton honors college, we try to hire faculty who live what they teach and live this way as noble models of a classical way of living. So I could have told another story about my, my dear friend and colleague, Fred Putnam, who spent an hour at least regale me, regaling me with all of his, his knowledge of clouds. We were driving back. We take our freshman cohort to the Adirondacks for a week of camping and uh, kayak camping and canoeing and hiking and that kind of stuff. And on the way back, he was doing the same thing with clouds because I look up at the sky and I'm like, oh, those are beautiful. And I can kind of name cumulus and, you know, the clouds I learned in fifth grade. But then Fred unpacked it in such a way. And I was like, oh, that's what it means to be able to engage the world. Yes. Uh, from the inside, but I think it's it's true for the natural world. It's also true for the economic world. You know, like the stock market, I have to confess, is a bit of a mystery to me. But those of people who who understand economics, that part of the world is no longer scary to them. It's no longer foreign because they mm -hmm. understand it. Or, you know, the philosophical world, the religious world, which is you know my my professional kind of domain. Uh, or whatever it happens to be. I, I think that's what we're trying to do uh, with students. You know, Charlotte Mason, uh, my friend Jim Taylor in his book, Poetic Knowledge, he said, this is what the tradition called this. It's poetic knowledge, that experience, yes. understanding, which is real knowledge of a thing, you know, like the, the, the child who grew up on a Kansas farm around horses like my cousins did. They understand horses before they ever learned the anatomy of a horse. They know horses, right. you know, and so that kind of poetic knowledge fosters our, our wonder and delight in knowledge. And we, we build on that in all the ways that I think Charlotte Mason does a really beautiful job of uh, describing. Oh, yes. I love Poetic Knowledge by James Taylor. It's a beautiful book. It's very, very, very much in line with the tradition and as the way I think Charlotte Mason uh, articulates the tradition right. in her pedagogy. Many of you have a desire to learn more about classical education. With this in mind, I'm thrilled to announce a new series of introductory webinar style courses that we are offering to help you become familiar with the roots of classical education. We have just launched our Snapshot series. Currently, we are offering snapshots of the great conversations as well as snapshots of the literary tradition. Lindsay Peterson and Mark Signorelli are master teachers who are in keeping with the tradition that Dr. Williams is talking about. They are offering these snapshot classes that are only one hour per month to help introduce you to the beauty of the tradition of classical education. For up-to-date course lists, you can visit us at beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. Look for our snapshot series to see what might interest you. Again, our website is beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. You can also visit us at Facebook, which is uh, groups forward slash classical education on Facebook. And uh, my email is beautifulteaching at gmail.com if you have any questions. Thanks for listening, and now let's return to the show. I'm thinking here, too, about parents who might be thinking, still wondering, I don't really still don't understand how this is going to help my student. Um, I guess maybe if you could unpack how, how 
how is it that immersing students with a with a teacher with these books through these the spirit of inquiry how is that really going to prepare these students really at the heart of parents really wanting a good education for their students i still feel like there's maybe a parent listening who's just not quite convinced yet and and i i feel like you could probably build in this a little bit more maybe with an example of how how good what te good teaching looks like in a classroom yeah i mean i guess the question i mean again this would be a conversation with with parents and when they say you know if a parent says something like oh i want them to be prepared i mean the question is prepared for for what exactly mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. or i want them to get a good education and you, you have to ask okay let's define our terms what does a good education mean to that particular parent so you know uh some parents might mean i want them prepared to do well i guess on like an act or sat or mm -hmm, i want them mm -hmm. to be prepared to do well in university uh and then the question is always you know well what 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 does that mean and to what end so they can graduate university and get a job usually and again getting a job is important getting a job and making money it's it's a it's an instrumental good that uh, allows you to pursue other kinds of goods so the classical model is really about, I mean, in many ways, helping students learn how to think uh, mm -hmm. so that no matter what they encounter, they know how to analyze information, they know how to think about it, they know how to reason about it, they know how to articulate at least a, a provisional conclusion they know how to ask good questions. I mean, this is why so many uh, of our business leaders, CEOs around the world will say, don't get a degree. If anybody did this, fine. We'll say, don't get a degree in business. I've heard this over and over and over again, get a degree in philosophy. I've just heard so many, or get a degree in the, in, in the liberal arts, get a degree in a discipline that'll teach you how to think, how to communicate, how to ask good kinds of questions, no matter what you're going into. So whether it's the math field, I mean, in the Honors College, we have lots of students who are math majors and cybersecurity majors, and we have lots of majors who are biochem majors coming out of the Honors College here. And one of the things that uh, kind of great books, classical education helps them do, again, is patiently sort through challenging material, asking good questions, reasoning about it, and then being able to articulate well, a kind of provisional or settled conclusion. I mean, and that's what we're, you know, that's as far as when we think about helping students achieve or be prepared for academic success. But again, we want to help, I think, parents recognize that education, uh, only in certain slivers of the 20th century has education simply been about job, you know, preparation for gainful employment. But we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to think about what does flourishing as a human person look like for your child? What do you want? What kind of person do you want them to be when they're 28 and 48 and 68? And how do we help them become that kind of a person? And uh, what are the what are the what are the pedagogies that would help them become that kind of a person? And what is, what's the kind of material we want them to be nurtured on? And what's the kind of culture? we want them to be nurtured within. So I often think of the methods and the materials and the culture of a place, or if you will, the pedagogy, the content and the culture of a place within which students are going to be formed. And so, you know, certain kind of pedagogies, uh, I would say that nurture a child's, um, you can say more about this probably, I would call it their generative memory. Uh, because memory in the classical tradition was never just a receptacle where we store bits of data in filing cabinets. Memory is where we think and compose ideas. And to compose ideas, we have to we have to have some substance out of which we can compose those ideas. And so, helping students generate and uh, 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 form a generative memory, uh, mm -hmm. helping students, you know, learn to ask good questions, engage one another in a respectful, articulate kind of way. It just seems like these are the kind of people that, um, well, they're going to get hired and they're going to be good neighbors and they're going to be good church members and they're going to be good family members. Um, 
So uh, those are the kind of things I think uh, I, that come to my mind. Um, but you know, I'd yeah. obviously engage the engage the parent and you know, kind of uh, what, what's challenging for parents and anybody of like my age or your age is that none of us were educated like this when we were in you know K to right. twelve. Most of us were right. not. You know, I had a decent decent education, but it was really pretty haphazard in these kinds of things. And I, a lot of my education happened outside of school, I would say. So it's just hard for us to get our, our heads around a model of education that we didn't experience ourselves. Yeah, that's a really great point. I know one other uh, thing I think we could, we could touch on is how uh, some people have the misconception that classical education is just about reading old books. Only. Right. Like that's what, why are we just reading old books? Do you want to talk into that a little bit? Sure. I mean, one, one, one thing, um, classical education, uh, is, is not, it is not, um, it is not driven by nostalgia. It is not driven by a longing for the good old days that probably never really existed. It's not uh, a manifestation of what's called the anachronistic society which is folks who dress up, you know, it sounds like a good Sunday afternoon, like knights and ladies, and they recreate <laughs> medieval dances and Renaissance dances. And that looks like fun, but it's not what we're about. Um, so we're not just reading old things because they're old. Uh, I did a study one time. I looked at the publication dates of things like uh, Hamlet and Brothers Karamazov and uh, Jane Eyre. And then I looked at all these other books and plays that were published at the same time. And, you know, it, it's it's a hilarious list of about 100 things I have, books you've never heard of. Why? Because they weren't good. They they weren't passed on. There's a reason they weren't passed on. There's a reason we we don't read them. I mean, even Sophocles. How many plays did Sophocles write? It was, it was over 100, and we have seven of them? Because even in the, even in the classical era fourth century third century bc they started making top 10 lists i mean that didn't mm. wasn't by david letterman they start saying here's the, <laughs> here's the top 10 attic orators here's the top 10 tragedies here's the top 10 comedies recognizing these are the kinds of things that are nourishing that are life-giving that explore the human condition in rich and beautiful ways and so we need to copy those and pass them along so the tradition has always done that. And so we're not right. interested in books just because they're old. We're not antiquarians who just like dusty things. We're looking for books that are nourishing, that are truth-telling, that are beautiful articulations of the human condition and, and, and the questions that we just perennially have as humans. And so this is why... You know, when someone like, for me, a Flannery O'Connor or a C.S. Lewis comes along in the 20th century, of course we start reading them, even though they're really fairly recent, because they're, they, they're steeped in the tradition, but they're doing it in a new way, and we recognize, oh, here are new people to read. I and mean, it's like what I was saying earlier, when, when Dante comes along, people say, oh, wow, look at this beautiful articulation of the human condition and the soul with relation to God. Same with Shakespeare, same with new authors that are coming along. And so mm -hmm. we're not we're also not just trying to recreate medieval science. We recognize we've learned a lot, you know, since the 12th century. In astronomy and astrophysics, we've learned a lot since the 19, you know, 1901. And so we are interested in a robust understanding of the world and of new discoveries and new insights. Uh, one of the things I work on, my 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 actual training is as a um as an ethicist, uh, as a moral theologian. And so one of the things I also love is contemporary neuroscience. And so I've done work looking at Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which I, I teach every year, and contemporary neuroscience around the brain, and finding ways that these correlate with one another. And contemporary neuroscience confirms some insights that Aristotle had. And Aristotle you know, helps us maybe see some things that contemporary neuroscience can help us understand. I mean, that's that spirit of inquiry. That says, yes. hey, if we've got new knowledge and new insight, well, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna employ that, but the human condition is the same forever, and so we don't have better insights into the human soul necessarily than you know Plato, Shakespeare, uh, Dante. You know, contemporary psychologists they're 
articulating things that, you know, the classical tradition already did. And so we're not looking to, we're like, just, we're not dusty antiquarians. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize right. it with that. We're looking for things that really are true, good, beautiful, and holy, wherever we find them, whenever we find them. This is so well, so good. You're articulating it very well. Thank you. Um, I think we're getting to the end of our time. So I, I'd like to, uh, well, there's two things I want to ask you to do. One is I'm going to have a closing question for you that I give to all of our guests. But before I do that, I'd like to ask you to tell our listeners how they can um, know more about your work and uh, the Templeton Honors College, because we do have a lot of listeners who might be interested in your programs. Sure. Where they can find that, yeah. A absolutely. Uh, the Templeton Honors College uh, the, the website where you can find us is Templeton, that's T-E-M-P-L-E-T-O-N, templeton.eastern.edu. Our parent organization here, our parent institution is Eastern University uh, outside of beautiful Philadelphia. So it's templeton.eastern.edu. And we have three programs that we run here. Uh, one of them is called the Summer Scholars Program. It's a week-long program for high school students. Uh, and we do courses with our faculty on site here and some of our upperclassmen in things like the moral vision of C.S. Lewis, uh, fantasy literature and, and J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, American Revolutions, which focuses on the Revolutionary War, uh, the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement in and around Philadelphia here. So we have seminars out at Gettysburg and out at Valley Forge. And then we do one on coding with the ancients, which is learning how to code, but also thinking about the ethics of uh, artificial intelligence. So the Summer Scholars Program, our undergrad program, is a, a general education uh, program which allows our students to major in whatever they want to while also doing their 40 hours of general education credits in our integrated uh, great books curriculum. And we have a master's in classical uh, teaching and MAT program for teachers in classical schools. So okay. they, they can focus on, they can look there for Principia, uh, you can just Google Principia Journal of Classical Education. Our website is hosted by Baylor University, and it's published by the Phil uh, Philosophy Documentation Center. So you can find us either place there. And I would encourage people to to look up Principia and sign up for a uh, a free online subscription. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, it's a great resource. And I will make sure there's links to all of this in the show notes. Great. Um, okay, so my closing question is, I have two, you can choose from one. <laughs> is there a quote that has had a, a very large impact on your life? And I'd like you to share that with us. Or what is a book that you wish you had read sooner in your life? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, or you can answer both. Some people yeah. answer both. <laughs> Fine. Uh, I mean, the, a quote that I come back to a lot as a teacher, when I think about my own journey as a student and now training teachers, is uh, one by great English classical educator, uh, John Henry Newman. I learned so much from Newman. Uh, he wrote three different volumes on, on the university, and one of them called The Rise and Progress of, of Universities. Um, Newman, as an educator, reflects a lot, uh, reflects often on just what it means to be a, a teacher. And so uh, a small quote, uh, and the reason it, it comes immediately to mind is I, I, I tag it on all my emails because I think it just captures what we're trying to do here in our um, learning community, the Honors College, and, and, and it's this. He says, uh, and he's, he's writing this, interestingly enough, he's writing this in a moment when cheap publishing has come on the scene. And you can disseminate information anywhere you want through cheap publications. It was kind of like the, the 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 19th century moment of the internet, where you could you didn't have to you know go to a library. You could send out cheap uh, paperbacks of different things, and you had reading rooms and Carnegie libraries popping up all over the world. And Newman says this though, he says the general principles of any study you may learn by books at home, but the detail. The color, the tone, the air, the life which makes it live in us, you must catch all those from those in whom it lives already. And I love that. And, and he says, we must retire to the sources ad fontes, which sometimes, in the, you know, in the Renaissance, that meant going back to the original books. But for Newman, it means going to the teachers, 
It means finding the people I would, doing what I would describe as living classically. Uh, and again, those are the kind of people you want your students to, to be with in their schools. Uh, for people who are homeschooling, it's the kind of people you want to be and the, the families that you want to foster, uh, people in whom this, this spirit uh, lives already. So that's, that's, the, that's a quote about the, the significance of teachers. Boy, books that I wish I had read um, earlier than I did. Um, I would have benefited from so many books. Um, I mean, the one that comes to mind that I think for me really was was transformative. I didn't read Dante's comedy until I was out of college, but it was the first book I read after I graduated. And I spent a very glorious summer after I graduated reading the comedy. I, I had read good stuff before that. But, you know, if I have a, a kind of before and after, it's before Dante and after Dante. And I've and that was, you know, that was 30 years ago, and I've never shaken loose of that and have just spent, I would say, a, a lot of my life um, teaching on the comedy, reading the comedy, circling back through the comedy. And for me, it's the only book, as a Christian theologian, it's the only book comparable to Scripture that every time I come back to it, I see new things, in part because I'm a different person, and Dante speaks to a different part of my soul every single time. So it, it, it's a book, and we... we um, co-sponsored a great event a couple of years ago called 100 Days of Dante, along with I remember Baylor, that. Yes. institutions. Yeah. And so people can look up 100 Days of Dante too. And in part, that emerged from my own love of Dante and my own 30-year uh, journey now with, with his comedy. So there you I'm go. I'm really glad that you said that book because I was literally sitting on the couch last night and I looked at my husband and I said, you know, there's one book that you have to read before you die. You Nobody should ever die without having first read Divine Comedy by Don. I will say that. And let me just say this. Uh, don't, I mean, I'll try not to get started on my soapbox here, but so <laughs> many schools only have students read The Inferno. Right. Oh, which is like, yes. well, I, and I always ask, no. what other what what other book or movie do you only read or watch the right. first third of and pretend you got it? Do you read the first third of Hamlet? Do you, read, do you watch the first third of any movie and think you understand yes. it? No. And so I, I, if there's one thing, I, you know, I don't know, I have lots of missions. I just please, if you're out there listening, teach the whole comedy. I or, agree. Please yes. Teach selective cantos from the entire comedy. Do not let your high school English teachers only teach the Inferno. Why on earth did you leave your students stuck in the pit of hell with Lucifer? Come on, get them out there and get them to God, right? I agree with you 100%. <laughs> it's so good. Thank you. That was really good advice. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for being on today. I appreciate your time. Oh, what a delight. This was a, this was a real treat. And all best to, to your listeners out there. Thank you. thank you for listening. You can get involved in a few ways. There's a Facebook page where we actively discuss the ideas around classical education. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. And if you want to help offset our production costs, you can support the podcast financially by going to www.classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash support. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once said, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>